ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of IRIS, I welcome all of you. And let me also mention that it is a great honor for us to have Ms. Victoria Scoffel and Dr. Christopher Sweden, who have graciously joined us through Zoom. And I would like uh, uh, to thank our friends from Azad Kashmir also, who have traveled all the way to join us here. Today, we have gathered here to deliberate upon different narratives regarding the dispute of Jammu and Kashmir by having a discussion on the topic, Unveiling Complexities, the narratives on Jammu and Kashmir will try to make an effort to not only understand the dispute in a better way, <clears throat> but also to carve out pathways for peace. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Dushka Hussain Sayyid. Uh, she, is, she is a renowned historian who had been associated with the Department of History at the Kaidyazan University. Uh, today, she is going to tell us that how the Kashmir dispute is viewed in history. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try very hard to restrict myself to 15 minutes. And uh, basically, the thrust of my presentation is that the planning for annexation of Kashmir was taking place uh, for a few months before it actually, the accession took place. And uh, the Muslim League and the Qaeda were kept oblivious of it deliberately. Mountbatten was very much a part of that, of conniving with the Congress leadership to pressurize and coerce the Maharaja into acceding to the thing. So it was all, a, my argument is that it was a conspiracy and I'll try and substantiate all that. Kashmir was swept by political agitation in 1931. Two groups emerged, the National Conference led by Sheikh Abdullah and Muslim Conference led by Mir, Mir Waiz Yusuf Shah and Sheikh Ghulam Abbas. The story starts in 1944. when the Qaed visited Kashmir on the invitation of Mir Wais and se several other people, including Sheikh Abdullah. And he visited Kashmir in May 1944. Sheikh Abdullah had already established a relationship with the Congress in 1936-37 and had changed the name of Muslim Conference to National Conference under the influence of Nehru in 1939. When the Qaeda visited uh, Kashmir, he advised the Sheikh to reform and reorganize Muslim Conference. And he conveyed to Sheikh Abdullah that the working committee of the new and reformed Muslim Conference would be formed by Sheikh Abdullah. So basically, the Qaeda asked Sheikh Abdullah to change the name of the National Conference to Muslim Conference. His argument was that he could not possibly support the idea of the National Conference as being a representative organization 
of the Muslims because he had not done that in India either. As late as mid-July 1947, the Qaeda was reported as saying that his position was that the Indian states were free to join either of the two assemblies or remain independent. Actually, there was no option given to the states to remain independent. And we'll see how that proceeds. Kak was the leader of Kashmiri pundits who was not averse to accession to Pakistan. The pundits felt reassured because of Jinnah's personality who was secular in his views. Now, obviously, as we all know, with the objective wow. resolution, we have gone in a different direction. And I don't want to dwell on that anymore. And a lot of this information is based on the interview of Mr. Yusuf Baj, whom many of us who worked on Kashmir know that he was a veteran Kashmiri nationalist who then served at the UN just and died a few years back. June third plan had been announced. And now watch what happens. Mountbatten decided to proceed to Kashmir that same month. And guess whom he asks to prepare a note, a brief. On which he could base his entire presentation and arguments to the Maharaja. He asks Jawaharlal Nehru. This is what Abdullah wrote. Abdullah's movement is allied with the State People's Conference, which has been working in cooperation with the National Congress. Sheikh Abdullah has become the vice president and last year while in prison was elected president of the All India State People's Conference. While Kak was Prime Minister, the Congress realized that they could not bulldoze the annexation. Kak took over as Prime Minister in 1945. And his Policy towards the National Congress underwent a change. In the note that Nehru wrote for Mountbatten, the demand was that Kashmir should join the Indian Constituent Assembly, and that was also the Maharaja's wish. It could not join Pakistan because the national conference was against that and it would lead to trouble. Now, for whatever reasons, Sheikh Abdullah had been cultivated by the Congress leadership and by Nehru in particular. And the chemistry between Sheikh Abdullah and the Qaeda was not very positive. So that had alienated Sheikh Abdullah. And that Sheikh Abdullah, as we all know, played a key role in the accession of uh, Kashmir to India. 
The Viceroy visited Kashmir from the 18th to the 23rd of June, 1947. He was scheduled to see the Maharaja alone for an hour on the 22nd. But on the appointed day, the Maharaja fell sick and the meeting could not take place. Basically, the Maharaja was taking cold feet and didn't want a one-to-one -one with Mountbatten. However, Mountbatten did manage to persuade the Maharaja from making any statement about independence or about their, in about their intentions towards independence. But he also advised the Maharaja, and it was a very enigmatic advice, that so far as possible, they should consult the will of the people and do what the majority thought was best for their state. It was, how was the how was he to consult the people was left to the discretion of the Maharaja and his close advisors. Whether it was elections, referendum, or plebiscit, the Mountbatten did not specify. Mountbatten's June visit had not sewn up the accession of Kashmir to India. But Mountbatten had managed to convince the Maharaja and his Prime Minister not to declare independence. So a decision by the Maharaja was in advance. Now, the intrigue begins to take its peak. Gandhi met Mount met with Baumbatten on June 26th and declared that either he or Nehru must visit Kashmir at once. The Congress leadership was displaying an urgency. Mountbatten then repeatedly wrote first to the Maharaja and then also to Webb, the resident in Kashmir pressing on Maharaja that if he did not agree to see Gandhi and meet with Gandhi, Nehru would, would arrive. And Nehru was like a red rag to the bull because Nehru was uh, very political, regarded as very political. Gandhi still had the covering the appearance of uh, not being so political. On 3rd of July, Patel wrote to the Maharaja. Now, this letter is very important. Because it re reveals that Gopal Das, who was a prominent businessman from Lahore, to be the interlocutor with the Maharaja on behalf of the Congress. As the Maharaja had been inaccessible to the Congress leadership and even avoided a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Mountbatten when the latter visited Kashmir. Patel wrote, eighty percent of India is on this side, and added ominously that states that have cast their lot with the Constituent Assembly have have been convinced that the safety lies in standing together with India. This letter was sent to the Maharaja. Patel, as we find out, discovered a key role in the whole operation. The Viceroy, now the Machiavellian role of Mountbatten. 
the viceroy had a meeting with Qaid Azam Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, on the 5th of July and told him that he had heard that he, Jinnah, had written to the Maharaja of Kashmir, urging him to join the Pakistan Constitut Constituent Assembly and promising them favorable treating, treatment, including the continuation of the autocratic government. It was a total cock and bull story made up by Mountbatten to put the Qaeda on the defensive. The Qaeda flatly de denied having written to the Maharaja and said that he had no intention of doing it either, but, but would like a meeting with, the pri with Prime Minister Kaak next time he was in Delhi. Not only was the Qaid kept oblivious of how the Congress leadership was visiting and lobbying with the Maharaja, but the Viceroy did not arrange a meeting between the Qaid and the and Kaak. The Qaeda was operating on a different level altogether, quite oblivious of the intrigue. On the 11th of July, he said, I have already made it clear more than once that the Indian states are free to join either the Pakistan Constitu Constituent Assembly or the Hindustan Constituent Assembly or remain independent. However, the breakthrough for the Congress came on the 14th of July when Ramadar, Secretary of All India Spinners Association, wrote to Patel from Siri Nagar saying that he was writing at the behest of Gopal Das. Please note the teamwork that was taking place. He wrote that joining the Indian Union would follow if the demands were met. Demands were met by the Maharaja. This was on the 17th of July. The Maharaja gave his word for the following. General amnesty to be proclaimed within a week or 10 days cark to go as soon as possible. When the discussion about the visit of Nehru and Gandhi to Kashmir was taking place, VP Menon, another ace up the sleeves of uh, the Congress, He's, and he was now by now heading the state's department. He sent a letter to C.P. Scott for Mountbatten's meeting with Nishtar. C.P. Scott was heading the armed forces in Kashmir. And he wrote and this is, I think, extremely important. Muslim state like Kashmir cannot be kept away from Pakistan for long as we may leave this matter to find its natural solution. But unlike Hyderabad, it does not lie in the bosom of Pakistan and can claim an exit to India. Here comes the key, especially if a partition of the Gurdaspur district goes to Punjab. I'll need more than one minute. Well, what happened was 
scarf was removed. Soon after Gandhi's meeting with uh, the Maharaja, and Janak Singh appointed in his place. But that was a temporary. A week after Gandhi's departure from Kashmir, Kak resigned as Prime Minister and Major General Janak Singh was appointed. Kak had been the the Dogras who held a dominant position in the state of Kashmir had been hostile to Kak. And so was the Swami who wielded great influence with the Maharaja. As soon as Kak was gone, all the prisoners of the National Conference were freed. Censorship was imposed on Hamdar, the Urdu newspaper owned by Prem Nath Bazaz, who was again a left-leaning Hindu pundit but sympathetic to Pakistan, who was pro-Muslim League and the Kashmir Times. Patel then took important administrative measures. He replaced Major General Scott by Lieutenant Colonel Sing the torch as the commander in chief of the Kashmir replaces to replace Major General Scott. He also nudged the minister. See the far sightedness and the planning. Nyogi, Nyogi, who was the minister of refugees to release the planes that had been providing tight service to Sirinagar. They were planning to fly Indian armed forces to Sirinagar. Justice Meher Chand Mahajan had been the Congress rep on the Ratcliffe Commission. He was now entrusted with another critical job the accession of Kashmir and made Prime Minister on 15th October 1947. And he delivered. Grafty Smith, who was High Commissioner in Pakistan by then, wrote, that he met Scott. The general impression left on me by my conversation with General Scott is, and I'm quoting from Graftisman, that the little clique led by Maharani, which overpowerly influences the Maharaja of Kashmir, is working hard to secure conditions favorable to a declaration by His Highness of accession to the government of India. Now I'm about to finish. What is key is, and I quote Andrew Whitehead's commission in Kashmir, who's a Brit and has uh, was stationed in India 
as a BBC comes corresponding. One, he says that the instrument of accession cannot be found, it cannot be accessed. Second, he says that the instrument of accession was signed after the Indian troops landed in Kashmir. I think that is very important. Mountbatten's signature on the accession was on the 27th of October, 1946. The troops had landed on the 26th in Sirima. But writing a dispatch to the Secretary of State, this is uh, the guy in uh, serving in uh, India in the American Embassy on November 8th, Lewis. Analyzed what had gone wrong with the accession of Junagadh and Kashmir. He wrote that the government of Pakistan made what appears to have been a serious mistake in supporting the Nawab of Junagadh's accession to Pakistan. Since in supporting that accession, it placed the government of Pakistan in a weak position for contesting the accession of the Maharaja of Kashmir to the Dominion of India because majority of the population in Junagar was were Hindu. And then basing the Pakistan case for that Pakistan on grounds of Kashmir could have been because its population was majority was Muslim and it was contiguous to Pakistan that way. So that was just to together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dishka. Uh, before I hand over the floor to another speaker, I would like to request the audience to please Put your mobile phones on silent mode. Uh, Dr. Dishka, uh, you have very rightly pointed out the discrepancies in what was planned on paper in history and what was actually done. And also, you have highlighted a teamwork that eventually led to hunt for the team. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Victoria Scottwood. Uh, she has authored a remarkable book on the dispute of Dhamma Kashmir, Kashmir and the Crossfire. It is truly written without any bias. I can say that because I've read it. And it appears from her work that she has deep empathy for the oppressed people of Dhamma and Kashmir, and she truly wants justice for them. Uh, today, she is going to tell us that what lessons we can learn from history. So over to you, Dr. Victoria. Assalamu um, Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you can all hear me from London. Yes, yes, yes you, are, you are audible. Okay, you can all hear. Um, we've had a little difficulty hearing you, I have to admit, so I haven't been able to follow everything everyone's been saying, but it's it's been extremely interesting to listen to you. And of course, very important um, that we are discussing this subject. Um, I should like to mention it is actually 24th of October, United Nations Day. I think it's very appropriate that we're talking about Kashmir on United Nations Day. Uh, the first point I actually want to make is that we do talk about the Kashmir issue. But more correctly, it is the Jammu and Kashmir issue, which has remained resolved, unresolved for over 76 years. And it is the Jammu and Kashmir issue which needs resolution. As the years have passed, the situation on the ground has changed and changed again. 
And I, in listening to the detailed history of the last speaker, I think it's it's interesting. As we know, when it first arose as a political dispute, it was one about sovereignty. Following the independence and partition of the subcontinent, there was initially no ceasefire line, no line of control. There was, however, already a group of individuals pressing for greater freedoms from the autocratic rule of the Maharaja, to which they'd been subjected. Some looked towards Pakistan for the future allegiance, others looked towards India. But at the time, there was no talk of independence such as we would define it today. Instead, in 1947, it was anticipated that the whole princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, including all its component parts, and this is very important to recall, Gilgit, Baltistan, Ladakh, Jammu, the border regions of Neelam, Kotli, Punch, Muzaffarabad, and Mirpur, as well as Jammu and the beautiful Valley of Kashmir, would all become part of one new dominion or another. Partition of the state along communal lines was not considered, and the only consideration given to the Maharaja's own preference for remaining independent was to deter him from thinking that this might be a possibility. We've just heard the long explanation about the dismissal of Prime Minister Kak. So in my remarks today, I want to emphasize the fluidity of the Jammu and Kashmir issue. It is not static. What might have happened at a certain time may no longer happen. The ground realities have changed. At the same time, certain principles remain finite. The right of individuals to political and religious freedom, good governance, the rule of law, freedom of movement and association, freedom of expression, freedom from military occupation, so our challenge today is to ask how those principles can be achieved in today's world. In my presentation, I want to highlight certain major milestones over the past, over the past 76 years. Finally, I want to ask the perhaps unanswerable question, what can we learn from those milestones? Or has the situation changed so irrevocably that there is no going back. What, if anything, can we learn from history? So what are those milestones? Of course, the first milestone was indeed partition, followed so swiftly by the 1947-48 war and the establishment of the ceasefire line. The unheld plebiscite. Had the conditions been met for holding the plebiscite as prescribed by the United Nations in 1948 and 49, the history of the region would have been very different. As I mentioned, the whole state would have gone either to India or to Pakistan, depending on what the outcome of that plebiscite was. Whether all the inhabitants would have been happy with the outcome is another matter, but undoubtedly the issue would have been, as I would say in quotes, resolved, and the inhabitants would have had to adjust to their new status. But as we know, the plebiscite was not held. The next milestone, major milestone, is really in 1962, uh, the 62-63 talks after the Sino-Indian War. I think this is an important milestone because although from the outset, the Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, made it clear that there was not going to be any negotiation, as he called it, at least the two sides were talking. And so I do consider this to be a milestone. It was the first time when under the, uh, the uh, auspices of both the US and the UK, there were discussions. And significantly, it was the first time there was serious talk of partitioning the state. Previously, as I've mentioned, the idea was that either the whole state should go to one country or the other. And we've heard that this morning as well. So this was an important development. Of course, there was no agreement where that partition might take place and the talks eventually founded. But the principle was established that neither country would incorporate the entire state within its borders. Furthermore, 15 years after partition, certain inhabitants had already become accustomed to the status quo. This was particularly true of Gilgit Baltistan, also the newly formed Azad Free Jammu and Kashmir, that narrow strip of of land, which we know as AJK, and Ladakh, and also Jammu. 
And it is from now onwards, attention begins to be focused on the Valley of Kashmir, that small area, 25 miles long, 80, 25 miles wide, 80 to 85 miles long. So that when we talk about the Kashmir issue, invariably what we are really talking about is the Kashmir Valley issue. And I think this is an important point to make because as I stressed at the beginning, until we've resolved the entire issue, we're not going to get resolution of the Kashmir Valley issue, nor indeed of the Jammu and Kashmir issue. I think the 1965 war was another milestone. It didn't actually achieve anything, but it certainly hardened attitudes between India and Pakistan. And what I have found in my research over the decades I've spent focusing on Jammu and Kashmir is that when there is a hardening of attitudes, there is no margin for being able to talk. Of course, this was followed very soon afterwards by the 1971 war, less related to the actual uh, ground realities in Jammu and Kashmir, but leading to the 1972 Shimla Agreement with that critical clause that both countries would seek to resolve outstanding issues. If you read the clause, there was no actual mention of Jammu and Kashmir, but the point was that they would resolve them bilaterally or by any other means mutually agreed upon. This becomes a huge milestone because it indicated to the international community that India and Pakistan would seek to resolve their disputes bilaterally. More important, it provided the opportunity for India to say that the international community, international mediation or facilitation was no longer necessary. And this is what has become so much part of the narrative. Whenever um, international mediation or facilitation is offered, the response from the government of India is to say, we've agreed to resolve our issues bilaterally. Uh, what's significant is that it loses the other critical part of the clause, which implies that if bilateral means fail, then the door is still left open to any other means mutually agreed upon. In other words, the possibility of international mediation or facilitation. And I do think this is a very important part of the narrative, which is, is often overlooked. And to me, it's a milestone because you talk to international uh, uh, analysts even today and they say, no, India and Pakistan want to resolve their, 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 their issues bilaterally. Then, of course, we come to the 1989 insurgency. Uh, and this is another milestone. Um, the rise of what, what for um, a broad term is called the independence movement. We've come a long way from the voice of Jammu and Kashmir being the voice of either India or Pakistan. We now have a very vociferous voice from among the inhabitants themselves, predominantly from among the valley, asking for the third option of independence. But again, there is this caveat because this voice is predominantly the voice of the Kashmir Valley with some small regions of Jammu. It is not necessarily the voice of Ladakh, nor Gilgit, nor Baltistan, and for the most part, not the voice of AJK. 2001 is another milestone, because up until then, you had the, the, the rhetoric of freedom fighting. And I was myself traveling in Jammu and Kashmir during this, this period in the 1990s, during the insurgency. And you would ask people, we're fighting for our self-determination, we're freedom fighters. But unfortunately, in the world geopolitic, after the 9-11 attacks in New York and Washington, um, the whole thought of freedom fighting became defined as terrorism. And it became much more difficult to disassociate what was being fought for in Jammu and Kashmir compared with international opinion that this was all terrorism. And certainly I think we saw a change in the movement after that. Um, freedom fighting was no longer considered to be acceptable and no longer would receive any international support. This was followed fairly soon afterwards, and I think this is another important milestone. Um, there had been talks between India and Pakistan. I won't detail them all. I'm sure you're all familiar with the history. 
but the, what's called the 2004 peace process, setting out a strategy which might have worked, whereby India and Pakistan might have agreed to um, a resolution of the issue. Um, this was under General Musharraf. He embodied other principles which had been suggested by other leaders. But unfortunately, it, um, it was not followed through. And I think it was remarkable in the wake of the 1999 Kargil War, which was another huge standoff between India and Pakistan, that the leaders of India and Pakistan managed to get to talking again after that 1999 Kargil War, which is, as we know, uh, created a nosedive um, leading up to um, the 2000 and 2001 um, standoff, which was very, very problematic. Um, there was even talks of nuclear exchange between the two countries. But unfortunately, the realpolitik of both countries meant that they pulled back from this peace process. And we have never managed to get to a state where um, the two sides have been talking um, meaningfully about resolution of Jammu and Kashmir. We then fast forward to the other milestone, which of course is is huge, um, the 2019 abrogation of Article 370. Um, in my opinion, this moved the goalpost altogether. It was actually a unilateral contradiction of that, that important clause I, I pointed out of the Shimla Agreement in 1972, that neither side would seek um, to alter the status quo unilaterally. And of course, this is what India did by the abrogation. Uh, it's meant that it's been very difficult, I think, to um, look back to how the situation was. And as we know at the moment, the government of India is intransigent in terms of its, its proposals for what might happen in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, the fact that the map which is produced in a way has brought the Indian narrative full circle back to its position in 1947, that according to the government of India, the whole of the state is part of Jammu, uh, part of India, is an integral part is the word they use, um, because the Maharaja acceded to India in 1947. That's their narrative. It's not the narrative I know of Pakistan, but it is the narrative which at the moment um, is being uh, illustrated by the map, the official map, which the government of India has produced following the abrogation. As you know, the state of Jammu and Kashmir is now divided into two union territories. One is called Jammu and Kashmir, and it includes as a Jammu and Kashmir on the map. And the other is called Ladakh, and it includes Gilgit, Baltistan. It bears no relation to ground realities, but that is the map which they have produced officially. I know Pakistan has now produced its own map, and it shows how divided uh, the situation still is with these two contradicting maps. But I think what we are looking at now um, is a situation where actually talking about the plebiscite, and I know it's still brought up as a potential way of resolving the issue, with the choice restricted between the two countries, whereby the whole state would join one or other country, is no longer feasible. As we know from those who live in Gilgit, Baltistan, they very much feel they're part of Pakistan. Likewise, those who live in Ladakh very much feel they're part of India. So if we were to have a decision where the whole state went to one or other country, it would undoubtedly be contested. And I cannot emphasize enough that the dispute over Jammu and Kashmir is the dispute over the whole state. As I said at the beginning of my presentation, that aspect has not changed. If we want to talk about resolving the dispute over Jammu and Kashmir, there has to be agreement on all the state's component parts. Plus, you have to take into account the aspirations and diversity of the inhabitants. I know we talk about the majority Muslims, but we must also talk about the minority um, of the other regions, the Buddhists and the Hindus. As things stand, as I've mentioned with India's official map portraying the whole state as part of India, we are, I would say, at an impasse. 
And it will take time before you get to the negotiating table in the same way uh, the Indian um, and Pakistani leaders were talking in 2004 or in earlier talks which preceded that. That opportunities for dialogue have been there, but they have been missed. That is one of the tragedies that I think we are learning from these milestones. Another um, lesson from these milestones is that while the situation remains unresolved, future generations suffer. Since even since the insurgency, a whole new generation has grown up, landed with the baggage of their forebears of the unresolved issue. And I think as a historian, I feel this more than anything is that because these issues remain unresolved, future generations grow up um, in conflict. When I was myself in the Valley of Kashmir, even before the abrogation in 2019, I met school children who were not born um, uh, when, when the insurgency began, let alone born when partition took place, and their lives have been lived in conflict because the issue has been unresolved. The other lesson that we've learned from these milestones is that it becomes more dangerous. Attitudes don't soften, they harden. In conclusion, and I hope I've kept within my time, I want to quote one of the old freedom fighters, what he said to me almost 20 years ago, and this is one of the tragedies. Um, this was 20 years ago. If the situation is not resolved in another five or 10 years, there can always be another volcanic eruption. And this is what potentially might happen and more lives will be convulsed. So my final conclusion is that we may not have learned from history, but we need to. We need to learn from history, draw a line, and then move on. We have to take into account the ground realities, the milestones which have defined the dispute, but we have to move on and see what is practical and what is viable today, bearing in mind the aspirations of all the individuals who live in the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Finally, we cannot tolerate human rights abuses and injustice wheresoever they occur. So thank you so much for inviting me and I look forward to listening to the rest of the presentations. Office. Um, thank you, Dr. Victoria, for highlighting milestones of history, especially the making of Kashmir issue a bilateral issue. And I think this development has made this issue quite stagnant. Why it has become stagnant and why diplomacy couldn't work in this regard for delegating it on that. Uh, we have Ambassador Abdul Basit with us. Ambassador Basit has been Pakistan's High Commissioner to India from 2014 to 2017. It was during the first term of Prime Minister Modi. He has also written a book, Hostility, uh, Diplomats, Diary on India and Pakistan. And uh, let me also tell you that he, because of his bold stance in Kashmir, he also became very popular in India. So with this brief introduction over to you, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Let me first uh, correct that uh, Dr. Victoria Scofi never said that it's a bilateral issue between Pakistan and India. Uh, what needs to be under this, under this code is that it's uh, it's an issue which needs to be resolved bilaterally. But it, it uh, nowhere in the Shimla Agreement has it been said that it it's a bilateral issue. So that distinction needs to be maintained. Uh, now let me come to the subject which has been given to me as to what happened post of fifth August two thousand nineteen and uh, how Pakistan. Uh, did or has done diplomatically. There is a saying in English that uh, if you do not know where are you going, uh, any road will take you there. 
so uh, in my humble view uh, pakistan uh, pakistan's diplomacy pakistan kashmir policy post 5th august 2019 uh, had been by and large like a dicycle uh, at least i do not see uh, any direction uh, it has been driven with uh, inconsistencies uh, incoherence hence we have not been able to mount enough pressure on india uh and this is the crux of the matter uh, because now the in since the indians have crossed the rubicon they have made constitutional amendments uh we may call them illegal or may not agree with them but this is the ground reality now the case is subject us in the indian supreme court uh, and we by and large know as to what would be their <laughs> uh their judgment uh they in my view they would never uh, declare those amendments ultra virus and uh and no government in in india in future whether it is the congress government or the bjp government uh, they would never take these amendments back so it's now given in my view unfortunately uh, after uh, what happened on 5th august 2019 Pakistan got panicked uh, we uh, we did not know how to really react despite the fact that uh, uh, this uh, was very much part of the bjp uh, election manifesto uh, both in 2014 and 2019 uh, despite the fact that uh, people like me uh, did uh, uh, warn islamabad that this would this would happen sooner or later but nobody took the matter seriously unfortunately and uh, when it happened again uh, we were caught unaware somewhat uh, we could not uh, convene a special session of the oic uh, we could not uh, have a formal meeting of the united nations security council unfortunately and then we uh, took a few steps which i think were uh, were were uh, were uh, uh, were correct in a way that we downgraded our relations with india uh, on the 7th of august our national security committee met uh, in islamabad so we took a cert- certain decisions including to downgrade our relations with india uh, suspend our bilateral trade with india then we uh it stopped uh, indian commercial planes to use our air space and so on and so forth uh in retrospect one would say that uh, those were those were all uh visceral i mean reactions and were not really thought through properly in my view but in any case now we are in a cold sack and we do not know how to get out of that uh, blind alley uh, we are kind of groping in the dark uh on the one hand uh, we said that uh, we would not negotiate with india or we not have any dialogue with india unless the status quo ante is restored but look at the irony of our position uh, on the one hand we are saying no dialogue on the other hand we were engaging with india and as a result of those back channel uh, talks pakistan and india uh signed a ceasefire agreement on 25th of february 2021 so where our credibility is gone uh, i still trying to understand as as to how our decision makers really work uh and then secondly uh the whole game was you know how to build pressure on india both within and outside external and internal pressure and in my view we failed on both accounts uh Uh, we uh, if you see uh, the entire huriyat leadership is behind bars at the moment right from dr qasim taktu to shabir ahmed shah you name anyone yasin malik asia andrabi you name anyone and masada talam who is the head of the other faction of the huriyat me wise alam is under house arrest so all these people the huriyat there is a political vacuum in in, in occupied jammu and kashmir uh and india is methodically uh pursuing its long term objective 
Whereas Pakistan, we do not know as to what our long-term objective is. If he wanted to build pressure on India, I'm still trying to understand as to why we went ahead with the Kartarpur corridor. I mean, religion is all very important. Uh, pandering to Sikh sentiment is all very important. But what is more important for Pakistan, that was really the time to build pressure on India. And we miserably failed in doing that because there was no coherence in our Kashmir policy. Uh, and that was, uh, in my view, if we had not allowed the Kartarpur corridor to go ahead, I mean, we would have seen six, you know, kind of uh, taking the Indian government to the task that because of your Kashmir, uh, irresponsible steps on Kashmir, the government of Pakistan uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, have not allowed the Kartarpur corridor to go ahead. So these are the small steps that you take if you're very clear as to what your long-term objective is. But in the context of Pakistan, unfortunately, we, uh, I mean, we are still kind of, you know, immersed in history. Uh, we would, I mean, we have a very strong case, frankly speaking, when it comes to uh, historical facts, legal aspects of the Jammu and Kashmir dispute. But the question is now what? Uh, how to proceed? People in Pakistan, you know, uh, after the after we suspended our talks uh, or our uh, relations with India or downgraded them, uh, we even heard in the previous government that uh, Pakistan is suffering hugely because of the suspension of bilateral trade. And we would, uh, I mean, our ministers, cabinet ministers would openly talk that let's resume our trade with India. So this is how we conduct our Kashmir policy or Kashmir diplomacy. I mean, there's so many things which can be said uh, as to what and where we went wrong when it comes to Kashmir diplomacy. Uh, sometimes we want to, you know, pander to India for no good reason. We appear to be soft. Then there is, I mean, uh, we have not been able to put up a, a, a national uh, narrative when it comes to Kashmir. Where is the effort to counter Indian narrative the way it is portraying the Kashmiri struggle as terrorism? Where is our narrative? Uh, and as a matter of fact, since in the past, we have not been able to do much about it. As a matter of fact, if you ask me, we facilitated Indians to help this narrative vis-a-vis -vis the Kashmiri struggle. If you go through the 6 June 2004, joint statement between Pakistan and India, we even indirectly uh, accepted, acknowledged that whatever is happening in occupied Jammu and Kashmir is terrorism. And Pakistan committed not to allow people going from here across the LOC uh, to fight there. I mean, we, we have ruined our case in my view. And uh, now, since we are, we have hit a, a huge, huge snag. Uh, we do not know uh, what not, a window of opportunity would be available when the elections will be held in Pakistan. If at all they are held next year, then we would have elections uh, in India. And whenever governments change, there is always a window of opportunity to revisit rejig your priorities and see how we can break the log, long log jam. Uh, in my view, if you ask me, I would be very much averse to entering into any formal structured dialogue with India because I am privy to what has happened in the past when we engage with India on the back channel from 2004 to 2014. I have seen how talks shifted from Jammu and Kashmir to issue of terrorism because of our, you know, uh, incapabilities, I would say, we, uh, diplomatically speaking. This is not the time to talk about formal talks with India. If at all, we want to break this deadlock, the best step would be that once we have new governments in place, both in New Delhi and Islamabad, the best thing would be to engage with India informally behind the scenes. And this time round, Kashmir should be discussed up front. We cannot be really, you know, uh, taking uh, crumbs from India and saying that, you know, uh, we have come, uh, we have achieved remarkable things 
as we did, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the UN Security Council meeting, only informal consultations were held on the 16th of August 2019. And in Pakistan, we are projecting that those informal consultations, if Pakistan had achieved something unprecedented, no formal meeting was held at the UN Security Council. Remember that. And see, since we ourselves, you know, misplaced things, the world does not take us credibly, unfortunately. Similarly, OIC uh, contact group met on the 6th of August because our then foreign minister was in Jeddah for Hajj. So he thought that before returning to Pakistan, let's have a contact group uh, on Kashmir meeting in Jeddah. And that was projected as the OIC is standing behind us. For heaven's sake, don't mislead your people. Don't mislead yourself because you are hoodwinking yourself. And then you kind of create delusions, illusions about the Jammu. And as, as you have succeeded and, you know, now Kashmir would be given to you on, on, on a platter. This is not how diplomacy is conducted. In my, uh, since I have two, three minutes left, I would conclude by saying that uh, yes, Jammu and Kashmir is very dear to us. Uh, we want this uh, dispute be resolved in accordance with the political aspirations of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. But we need to be realistic about it. What we can achieve and what we cannot. I fully uh, endorse what Dr. Schofield said. We would not like next generations to be caught in this fire. What is happening in, in Palestine? Uh, we are seeing that thousands of people have died. If Palestine, if the Palestinians cannot get their right to self-determination, despite all the sacrifices being given to them, be given by them, and then the entire Arab world, so-called Arab world, is standing behind them. The United Nations try to uh, submit or consider three draft resolutions. Nothing has worked despite 5,000 people have been killed just since 7th October, do you think you can get Kashmir? Uh, so, I mean, you need to be realistic. I am not for a moment suggesting that you should be negotiating or entering dialogue with India from the position of weakness. The question is what your strategy is. What you want to really achieve? What is your long-term objective? Indians are very clear. Their long-term objective is to get even Azad Jammu and Kashmir and Gilgil Baltistan. You, you go through their 22nd February 1994 resolution, their parliamentary resolution, you will get the entire their entire plan of action. But here, in November 2019, we come up a new political map, as Dr. Dush, Dushka said, showing Junakar as a as the as a disputed territory. For heaven's sake. Don't, I mean, you undermine your own case by coming up with a political map, new political map showing Junagar also as a disputed territory. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's uh, we have really made a mess of the entire thing. How to get out of this? I hope whenever we have a new government, they will bring all those who are interested in this issue together, have a really brain uh, storming session and come up realistic, tenable, palatable uh, policy options. And once we have our policy, then you employ, employ all your diplomatic tools, whatever you have in your hand. Without that, it is all rhetoric for public consumption. And I, for one, do not uh, believe uh, in all these. Having dealt you know, myself with these issues, I know for a fact that how our political leadership thinks about it, how our military leadership thinks about it, but let's know it's time that we should be very clear if Pakistan believes that our Kashmir policy is damaging the very existence of Pakistan or the survival of Pakistan, then obviously it is high time to revisit the drawing board and think anew. Thank you very much. Thanks to Vasu for finishing in time. And uh... You, you have very rightly pointed out about in, inconsistency of Pakistan's policy towards Kashmir. In August 2019, India revoked the special status of Kashmir. 
And in November 2019, so uh, we really need to recognize our mistakes in order to move forward in successful year. How peace can be achieved is a paramount question. And for deliberating upon that, we have Dr. Christopher Sneddon. Uh, he is an authority on Kashmir, and he is very vocal about rights of self-determination of the Kashmiri people. He has authored three books on Kashmir, the latest book titled as Independent Kashmir and Incomplete Aspiration. So with this introduction, over to you, Dr. Sad. You're not audible, Dr. Sadden. Still, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, you're audible. Please go ahead. My apologies. Uh, Salam alaikum. Thank you very much. I have very fond memories of the IRS. I started my research on Azad Jammu and Kashmir at the IRS many years ago when some wonderful people called Nasir Zaidi and Nasreen Nakfi uh, were in the library and very helpful to me. So I have very fond memories of the IRS. Thank you to all of the previous presenters as well who uh, have added to this dynamic of what we're talking about today. Now, I'm a bit perplexed about what to say in terms of pathways to peace, examining solutions, because uh, there's five possibilities and perhaps even more. But the first possibility is what's happening at the moment. And in a sense, you could say that the Kashmir dispute is sort of resolved because nothing's happening. There's disinterest, uh, certainly on the Indian side. And I think one of the great challenges as Ambassador Bassett has suggested, is that putting pressure on India to even come and talk, that's a great challenge. India has what it wants, and it also has what Pakistan wants. And, and I think that's what um, Dr Schofield suggested, that this dispute really, in terms of the territory, is about who has control and possession of the Kashmir Valley. Uh, the, the, it is a dispute about all of Jammu and Kashmir, and that is absolutely correct. But the bit that both nations want is really the Kashmir Valley. And that's been the case really since 1947, which was why Nehru wrote that report that Dr. Saeed said. He was very much in touch with the Kashmir Valley, but he didn't have much of an idea about what was happening in the other parts. And he was partly in touch with the Kashmir Valley because of his Kashmir, Kashmiri ethnicity, but also because of his friendship with Sheikh Abdullah. And he didn't really know what was even happening in Jammu, as did many other people. Forget about Gilgit Baldistan, which was so far away. So uh, the first one is more of the same, I think, and probably that's what we're going to see for a period of time, unless and until there's some sort of an imperative for India to talk about it, and that may be as a result of a change of government or as a result of war with China. And China is a bit of a wild card in this whole dispute. And the, the uh, line of control ceasefire has enabled India to move troops up to that line of actual control that it remains very concerned about in relation to what China's doing there with its alleged salami slicing, taking more territory vicariously and very secretively. Uh, an incentive, international pressure, for example, and this would be also a great challenge to get the rest of the world, apart from those members of the OIC and possibly China, to say to folks, India's got to resolve this. India and Pakistan need to resolve this. Even China equivocates a bit. I was just reading the joint statement between the PRC and Pakistan from the 2nd of 11th, 2022, and China has said that it should be resolved, this issue, based on the UN Charter, relevant UN security resolutions and bilateral agreements. So they're not saying unequivocally just the plebiscite. They're saying it's, a, it's also a bilateral agreement, a discussion that India and Pakistan need to engage in. So a bit more of the same in terms of uh, disinterest. The second one is the plebiscite. Now, India did promise the plebiscite. There's no doubt about that. And in doing so, 
made both Pakistan and the people of Jammu and Kashmir parties to this dispute. Based on the dissolution of the princely states, there were 140 empowered rulers who could choose whether their state would join India or Pakistan in that state's entirety. And almost all chose India, usually for geographic reasons. Um, yes, it's true that Mountbatten did say to the Maharaja, you should try and consult your people, but these folks were autocrats and they didn't either have the mechanism or the will to consult their people. So that sort of went by the by. But in doing so, in promising the plebiscite, India did actually involve the people and also Pakistan it made them parties to the dispute. By 1955, the Home Minister of India Mr. Punt, G.B. Punt, who was a very influential Indian, the Home Ministry has always been very influential in India, he's saying we don't think there should be a plebiscite. And by about 1957, the UN is becoming a little disinterested as well because they can't get agreement between India and Pakistan. The chief issues being the demilitarisation of Jammu and Kashmir and by about 1957, Dr. Graham, the second and essentially fourth interlocutor for the UN, UN representative, has said maybe three to 6,000 Pakistani troops and maybe 12 to 18,000 Indian troops. And that's about as far as it went because neither side could agree how we're going to demilitarise, when we're going to demilitarise, who's going to be first, how many troops will remain. The other issue was law and order. Who's going to maintain law and order after we've demilitarised and India said, well, that should be us because clearly the government in Srinagar and Jammu is the legitimate government. There's the successor to the Maharaja and they should do it. Uh, Pakistan had other ideas because one of the basis of the problems of this dispute is the distrust between both nations. And in terms of coming to some sort of a solution, that is a huge hurdle, a huge impediment overcoming the distrust that Pakistan has for India and that India has for Pakistan because of various things that you have done to each other over the years. So the law and order one, uh, well, if you have troops from India maintaining law and order in our areas, clearly they're either going to influence the people to vote for India or they're going to rig the polls. And that was a real problem as well. And the third one then was also associated who would administer the plebiscite? India said, again, it should be the government on our side. And Pakistan said, no, it should be the United Nations. Who would be the plebiscite administer? They uh, administrator. Initially, they chose Admiral Nimitz, but he very quickly became unacceptable to India. So about 1953 and 54, Prime Minister Bogra and uh, Prime Minister Nehru are talking about maybe having the plebiscite and using that the results of that to see who voted for whom and then bifurcating, dissecting, uh, partitioning Jammu and Kashmir into Indian and Pakistani parts. But by about 1958, India is saying, really, no, we don't want the plebiscite. The, the Constituent Assembly has now become the Legislative Assembly and it has reaffirmed the accession to India. And by the way, Pakistan has joined these US-led pacts and we think that they may militarily try to take our part of Jammu and Kashmir from us militarily. And we don't trust that. We don't think the plebiscite's relevant anymore. And after that, from about 1965 is really the last time there's resolutions to do with Jammu and Kashmir. There were five, but none of them were talking about the plebiscite. Those five re resolutions in 1965 were all about trying to get a ceasefire to end the war between India and Pakistan. And since then, uh, the same issues are there with the plebiscite. How do you demilitarise? Who's going to conduct the poll? Unless you do what Dixon suggested and just have a regional plebiscite in the Kashmir Valley where it's not certain who people wish to be with. Uh, he very quickly worked that out, although his bottom line was when he submitted his report to the UN was, I tried, I failed. I can't get India and Pakistan to agree. Really, it's up to them. They should sort it out between themselves. So bilateral negotiation. So I think the plebiscite's a bit sort of out of date and problematic because there's not a lot of support worldwide for that. The next one would be the line of control. And there has been attempts to make that into the international 
boundary and seemingly after the similar accord, Mr. Butto and Mrs. Gandhi may have had a secret agreement that said we would do that, which is why there were various things happened on both sides, including changing the Legislative Assembly in uh, Azad Jammu and Kashmir to make that arrangement with Pakistan and also uh, changing unilaterally, as it turns out, in 1974, getting rid of the state subject status in the Gilgit baltistan area. Um, and also just recently um, on in the Friday Times, there was a gentleman in Pakistan who suggested that this should be also what we go with, that it's time to make the line of control into the international border. Now, that doesn't give what you need, Pakistan, access to that K in your name, Kashmir, and that is a challenge for you as well. Uh, and maybe as Mr. as Ambassador Bassett suggested, India's moved on from that, and now they're talking about getting all of Jammu and Kashmir and Gilgit back, Gilgit Baltistan back, and making that part of mainstream India, not just an integral part that they aspire to have it, but a, an actual part of Jammu and Kashmir that India controls. And there have been a couple of articles that uh, by Indian senior Indian military commanders, including the commander of the Northern Command last year, saying, if we're given the order, we will go in and militarily take it. Now, that's easy to say, very difficult to do, but uh, there must be military plans out there suggesting India's ready to do this, although it's not going to be unopposed by Pakistan. And there's this wild card of China, and not to mention the people of Jammu and Kashmir themselves. So the line of control is a challenge. The Musharraf formula is also something that people have said may be a useful way to uh, resolve this issue. And apparently, India and Pakistan did get very close during these discussions to coming to a solution. Unfortunately, General Musharraf lost power on his side and popularity. And on the other side, there was no certainty that Dr. Singh could deliver this solution because it's so easy to disrail, to sorry, to derail India-Pakistan discussions. And that was challenging as well. But Again, uh, the demilitarization was the first thing, and it was a little bit unclear what um, General Musharraf meant by demilitarization of Jammu and Kashmir. Did he mean all of Jammu and Kashmir or just the valley? There's always been a strand of folk within Pakistan who've said, well, Gilgit's not part of the Kashmir dispute. It wasn't ruled directly by the Maharaja, even though it was given back to the Maharaja quite clearly and openly and publicly on the 1st of August 1947. It was his territory, so it is part of the dispute. Uh, the other one is uh, self-governance for the Jammu and Kashmir, all of that area, an oversight mechanism uh, involving India, Pakistan, and the people of Jammu and Kashmir. And those, those would all be challenging. They, they would need to sort out all of those issues as well. And the other one is no changes to boundaries so that uh, the line of control becomes irrelevant. It, it can be crossed easily by people. And that would also require some negotiation. So uh, Happy Mon Jacob, who's done a lot of second track diplomacy, thinks this might be a good basis on which to uh, reinstitute discussions. That would be the Musharraf formula. Um, the other one, of course, is uh, something else. And as Victoria Schofield said, there is space within the similar agreement to uh, by any other peaceful means mutually agreed upon between them. So the two countries are resolved to settle their, different, their differences by peaceful means through bilateral negotiations or by any other peaceful means mutually agreed upon between them. Now, some of the UN resolutions, one or two, going back in time, did actually talk about arbitration. 1957, one of them talked about arbitration. India has said time and again, though, we're not interested in any other third party being involved. So the only way to resolve this dispute, I think, is between India and Pakistan. However, uh, my idealistic solution would be to devolve it to the people because they are a party to, to this dispute. And my books have suggested with evidence that they actually instigated the dispute, the Punch uprising, the inter-religious violence in Jammu in 1947, the creation of Azad Kashmir this day, 20, 76 years ago. It happened on the 24th of October. So they are a party to the dispute. It's about their lands. And we do have bodies that represent them. We have the AJK, Legislative Assembly. There's also now one since 2009 in Gilgit, Baltistan. 
there could be one on the Indian side. We do have the two hill councils in Ladakh, one of which has just had its re-election in Kargil uh, with a non-BJP result, as it turns out. Uh, but the other side's had governor's rule and president's rule for the last five years, although they're talking about having elections in this union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. So there are representative bodies, and I would say if India and Pakistan can't resolve it, then give it to the people and let them have discussions about what solution or solutions they want. Now, as I said, very idealistic and highly unlikely to happen. But um, as we said earlier, it is, or as it was, as, doc, as uh, Dr. Kwaja said, it's about people. We've forgotten about the people in this whole dispute. And it is very difficult for these people. The line of control separates families and districts and all sorts of things. They did have some contact until that was severed in 2019 with bus routes and trade, uh, but they still are forgotten. They haven't been consulted in any meaningful way. On the Pakistan side in Gilgit Baltistan, it only happened in 2009. It only happened in 1970 and Azad Jammu and Kashmir on the other side. It did happen much earlier, but many of the elections were influenced in inverted commas, which is a euphemism for rigged. And there's been very few free and fair elections. So let, if India and Pakistan can't resolve it, uh, let the people do it themselves. However, all of that said, I think we're just going to see more of the same. And the big challenge for Pakistan is to get India to move an inch uh, to start talking about this. Hopefully, when you've had new governments in place next year, that may happen. But the other one, I think, also is overcoming this incredible distrust between the two nations. That is a significant challenge. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Snyder, for your valuable insight. Uh, now I'll hand over the question to President Iris for further proceedings and for completing the session as well. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It was really a pleasure listening to everyone. Um, so we have uh, very little time left, so I think we can take about four to five questions. My request to everyone is to keep the questions extremely brief. And if you want to make a comment, please ensure that the comment is not more than 30 seconds. So the floor is open. Dr. Nazi. My second question is that whatever you mentioned, it was a plan, strategic plan of the Indian Congress. But there is also an attachment that probably, probably, it is in history books, I don't know. Uh, Mountbatten wanted to be the joint governor general of uh, the India and Pakistan. Does it also make uh, some reference to the personal interest of uh, Mountbatten for doing what actually was done by the Indian Congress. Thank you. Uh, the first question was... Andrew Whitehead says it doesn't exist anymore. It can't be accessed by any researcher. Obviously, the Indians have something to hide. It's a right cut here. Peter? Obviously, Andrew has researched everywhere, and this is what he says. I recommend that book to you. Mission to question. Um, may I say something on that? There's, there's two things. One, there is an electronic copy available of that accession. No, uh, I have seen it, signed by the Maharaja. The second thing is, to some extent, it doesn't really matter because he, he was making his intention clear. He was sold out to uh, the Congress. And everything he's done since is 
bears marks of that. So from his liaison of his wife with Nehru, I mean, it just goes on and on. Whether his ego was uh, bruised by the Kayat saying, don't want you as governor general. Obviously, the Kayat said that because he knew the guy is totally dishonest and is very biased. I don't think that is what caused him to behave the way he did. But his role is so dishonest, it's unbelievable. The more I research into it, the more I'm convinced about it. I hope I, I answered. Just you know, to, uh, to answer your question, to add, I think two books are very important to read. Uh, if one is uh, entrusted uh, or about uh, in the instrument of accession. One is by B.P. Menon, uh, the story of the integration of Indian states. I think it was published in 1954, if I recall correctly. And the other one is by Mehchan Mahajan, who was then also the Prime Minister of Raj Jammu and Kashmir, as was mentioned. No, sorry, not Raj Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, his book, Looking Back, that was published in 1960. So these two books give two different accounts of the instrument, instrument of extension. That is very, very intriguing. And then for the first time, the image of the instrument of extension was seen uh, in uh, Balabai Patel papers. I think those were published in the early 70s. So that was the first time we had seen uh, the image of the instrument. But that instrument, uh, as far as I know, I have tried to you know, dig deep into that. It is not available. The original copy was never shown neither to the United Nations Security Council nor to anyone else. So this so much for the instrument of Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Dr. Snyden, you had something to say. Yes, look, it's a, it's a bit of a, not a red rag to a bull, as Dr. Saeed said earlier, but it's a bit of a red herring, whether he signed it or not. I have seen an electronic copy. Ambassador Bassett said there's a, it's come out in the Patel papers, but it was his intention, and it's quite clear that by that stage, he wanted Jammu and Kashmir to join India. Whether he signed the document or when he signed the document doesn't really matter. But there is such a thing as a verbal contract as well. I want X and you say that and you mean it, that becomes a legal contract. So his intention by the 27th of, sorry, the 26th of October was clear. He wanted Jammu and Kashmir to join India. Can I also say something? Uh, can, you, can you hear me please? Uh, Victoria, you want to say something? Um Yes, I just actually wanted to um, uh, confirm what Dr. Snedden said. Uh, the the issue of the instrument of accession, um, he he never, if, if he hadn't actually acceded at some point, um, he would have made that very clear because he did become very unhappy. And there's one letter he writes where he's complaining about the treatment he's receiving. And he says, I really feel I might withdraw my, my accession. So I think the intent was there that, that at that time, as, as Dr. Snedden says rightly, um, the Maharaja had thrown his lot in with India for whatever, you know, for better or worse. That was, that was, uh, it was a compulsion he felt he must do. Um, the, the other point I wanted to, to raise is um, following on for the, um, from the comment uh, that um, Mountbatten might have been bruised by not being um, asked to be Governor General of, of Pakistan as well as Governor General of India. It's, it's actually in, in my book, and if anyone's got the book, I refer you to page 72. I found this document in the archives in the um, British Library. Um, it's not very well publicized, but when um, the Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah says that he doesn't want, he wants to be Governor General, Mountbatten actually writes to the British government and um, suggests that um, he should not anymore be Governor General of India on the grounds that he might be accused of having deliberately favored India in the partition plan. And he suggests therefore that he should fade out. So he's actually telling the British government that he doesn't think he ought to be governor general of India either. 
But the British government, this is the government of Clement Attlee, um, writes back saying there were strong arguments for him to take up the position. Um, and they go on to uh, pro provide those arguments um, as to why he should take up the position. So again, it's a little bit of a red herring to think that the fact that his his ego was piqued because he couldn't become governor general of, of Pakistan. Um, and I think it's just an important when we are looking at these past issues and because the is essential aspect is to move on and put the conflict and the distrust and the um, anger behind us before there can be any further discussions, it's quite important not to sort of um, hang one's argument on arguments which actually now have no more relevance. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dushka wants to respond. Christopher. Huh. Um, I'd like to respond to Professor Snedden issue is not that the instrument of accession was signed, but when was it signed? Was it signed after the landing of the landing of the troops in Sirinagar or before? 26th or 27th? Whitehead argues and he's given cogent arguments that it was done after the troops landed in Srinagar. Mr. Snedden, if you go through the work of uh, Merchant Mahajan, the Prime Minister of uh, Jammu and Kashmir then, he in his book uh, published in 1960 also writes the same thing. The, the instrument of accession was signed by Maharaja on the 27th of October, uh, as opposed to what P.P. Menon claims in his book that it was signed on the 26th. So there is a controversy, uh, as a matter of fact. But I, I just don't see what the, why this is such a deeply significant point. Uh, we're now talking about how to try and resolve an international dispute, and you're focused on the minutia, and this is a minute point. Uh, ultimately, it doesn't really matter because India sent their troops in the next day. He signed it on that day, whether he signed it before they arrived or whatever. India had their troops there. And to some extent, whether you like it or not, that's a fait accompli. And, and uh, I don't see getting back bogged down in whether he signed it, when he signed it, where he signed it, how he signed it really matters. It's a, it's a territorial dispute, not a dispute about when he signed his instrument of accession. For me, and I'm an outsider, it's a minor point. Then constitutionally and legally, we consider it an important point. Maybe for you it isn't. For you, the current dispute is, for a historian like me, I think the legality of Pakistan's position and constitutionally, it's important, very important for us. Uh, thank you. There is another viewpoint on this instrument of accession, whether it is it was signed or not on six, 26 or 27, whatever it was. India has surrendered it when it went to the United Nations Security Council. So there should be no discussion whether it uh, the instrument of accession exists or not, uh, whether it was signed on 26 or 27. India has uh, surrendered its claim to the United Nations Security Council. And then the United Nations Security Council said there should be a free and fair visit in, in, in the UN Kashmir uh, under the UN auspicious. So there is no, I should, there should be no debate on it. Uh, further, we should not keep a debate on it, whether it was signed or not ratified on 26, because uh, when Indian again tried in, two, uh, in uh, the Constituent Assembly, we they constituted into uh, 1956, again, they said that uh, the accession to the India is final. Again, the UN Security Council passed a resolution that no state assembly has the right to decide the future of the people of Jumat Kashmir. So there's a legal position is very much clear on it. We should not fall prey to the uh, historical event. Thank you, thank you. Th thank you very much, everyone. So we'll move on to the next question. Uh, we'll should I, right should I ask my question? Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, um, Ambassador Bassett, 
Uh, I think you are amongst us all, you are the one most experienced into the things uh, right with your hands and hands-on experience, either behind the corridors of the foreign office or into the deep LAs in India. Uh, we agree certainly that uh, we have uh, reached uh, to an impasse as mentioned by Ms. Victoria also. And uh, we also acknowledge that certain mistakes or you can say overlookings has been done in the past. Now, presently in this situation with all kind of challenges and with all kind of political like uh, leverage gained by the other side who might be the wrong side of the history, but keeping in view your experience and all everything you see, can you define some pathway for the country or for Pakistan to fight this case, a route to re in this case from where we are? If you can educate us on that, so that will be great. <laughs> No, you have raised an interesting question. Uh, what next? Uh, how to? I think there are certain things which Pakistan can easily uh, do. Uh, there are a few steps that Pakistan should be taking. So it's not, uh, this is not the forum where I should be elevating those uh, uh, three points, three steps that Pakistan needs to take. Because the whole thing comes down to building pressure on India to bring it to the negotiating table because India's current stance is that terror and talks cannot, not, cannot go together. So this I find uh, laughable, so to say, because India itself is involved. That is uh, all, you know, we all know about it. Uh, then I have mentioned a few things in my book, hostility as well as to what Pakistan needs to do in order to break the same path. But I now strongly believe that uh, no structured dialogue with India. That would be another huge mistake which we will commit if we enter into a structured formal dialogue, dialogue with India. What we need with India is when elections uh, have taken place in both the countries, we should find some space, diplomatic space, to engage with them informally behind the scenes. But it would be fantastic if we can have a third party involved uh, like Saudi Arabia, I, the country which comes to my mind, or UAE for that matter, uh, and uh, then see how things be taken forward. Uh, but uh, at, at, at present, uh, diplomacy needs patience. Uh, we need not be taking things in haste, uh, because in the past we uh, tried to break the log jam, compromising our basic fundamental uh, positions on Kashmir, and that really undermined us. So this is the time to show patience uh, and uh, let the elections be held in both the countries, and then you will see how to uh, break the, uh, the impasse uh, and uh, whether or not the Indian side is ready. And by hopefully, uh, we will have the Indian Supreme Court judgment by the time Indian elections are held, because that would be seen strengthening Prime Minister Modi's hands in the elections. Uh, we would, Ram Mandir has already been inaugurated, and you prepare yourself in the meantime for a false flag operation in February, March next year, uh, because that would help uh, Modi to get re-elected. So that should be our topmost priority at the point at this point in time, rather than thinking about how to build the impact. Because I am seeing. Uh, uh, tensions are uh, being ratcheted up uh, in the run-up to uh, elections in India. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Bassett. Uh, we we'll take the last question. Uh, Mirwais Umar Farooq, uh, you know, has been released and he has also addressed. So I would like to ask your uh, opinion of whether this will create a space for Hurriyat leadership um, in Kashmir. And we have also seen that opposition parties are, you know, arresting, uh, uh, sorry, uh, they are arresting on the policies of Modi government under the leadership of um, uh, Abdullah uh, 
Farooq. So, uh, how would you see uh, uh, for Hurriyat leadership in Meanwhile, Farooq Sahib, I have great respect for him, but uh, he has by and large been taking the middle line. And you would remember that he was also, uh, he also met Vajpayee uh, in the 90s. Uh, and uh, the Huriyat delegation went to meet with the Prime Minister. That is another uh, aspect which we need to ponder on because the Kashmiri leaders or Kashmiris are divided. You find the likes of Mahbubah Mufti, I mean, Sheikh Abdullah, and then Farooq Abdullah, and his son. Uh, on the other hand, you have the likes of the PDP, Mahbubah Mufti. So Kashmiris are divided. And then you have Hindu pundits. Muslim majority has now been reduced from 78 or 80 to 88 percent to now 67, 68 percent. Uh, so things have changed on the ground as well. So I do not know uh, whether this space would mean anything. In my view, it would not really matter much at the end of the day. And if Modi is re-elected, then prepare for more uh, stringent uh, and stubborn uh, policy, Kashmir policy on, on, on his part. Dr. Vani? Uh, sir, actually, the question said about uh, the space for Korea. Actually, the Indian government was under pressure from the international community to keep up on the legal side, the way they have curbed the legal side of the different facts. They have not uh, allowed the people to come out. And it was after a long time they allowed the procession on the Ashura. Uh, and then finally, uh, when they saw the heat about uh, not allowing the new players at least, and to in communication to the government of India on this, but even better than that. Why not allowing the new wife to address the Friday prayers? Now, the government of India has finally decided that they will allow the religious duties which we wife has, not allowing him to perform any political duty. This is what they have done. Anybody who is uh, questioning the legality, of uh, abrogating of Article 370, 35A, or any other thing, uh, that position is not there. So there will be no space for Korea or other leaders. Thank you very much. Like, you know, it's been a fascinating session. We've had uh, you know, four very eminent speakers who spoke about the Kashmir issue. You went into the history. You actually uh, analyzed what has gone on over the years and uh, what Pakistan has done in its policy and uh, what uh, basically happened in 2019. So where do we go from here? That is, I think, the most important question. I think uh, the first thing is that uh, with my experience of teaching students in universities, I think we need to have the necessary awareness because somehow uh, when you interact with students, you find that you know they are a bit uh, uh, removed from the actual history and they do have a tendency of propagating the Indian people. Now, the UN resolutions, they continue to remain extremely important. And uh, like uh, I and Ambassador Abbas, Basad and I, we were at a, at a, at a gathering together with, uh, with young foreign service officers. And there, it was very, very clearly stated by Ambassador Basad that UN resolutions, once they are passed, they can only be revoked by the UN. They cannot be revoked bilaterally. So I think that is uh, something which is important, which our youth needs to know. And uh, if in a if in one line one has to say, the story of Kashmir is one of most missed opportunities where uh, Jammu and Kashmir continues to be. Um, Article 30, uh, 35A and 370, in my humble opinion, I think they are done. I don't think any future Indian government, whether it is the BJP or whether it is the Congress, or any, or, or any other uh, coalition is going to undo it. I think we have to be very, very watchful about the domicile laws, which the Indians have now introduced in this particular area. And uh, if ever a plebiscite is held, uh, these domicile laws will change the demographic pattern of the population in the disputed territory. So uh, I think that is something which we need to be watchful of. Um, 
Unfortunately, whether it is Kashmir or whether it is Palestine, one has to be very, very cautious about the geopolitical realities of the world and of the region. So Kashmir is a wound. It will continue to fester, but one has to see that it does not create the regional instability which will uh, lead to umpteen problems of a particular region which already is under a lot of pressure. But then um, we have to also look at uh, the violation of human rights in India, which is described as the largest open prison. So I think it is essential that the international community should be made aware, be made aware of it. And it should be impressed upon them that they have to put the necessary pressure on India to at least alleviate the suffering of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Well, we have to learn from history. We all talk about a particular word, narrative. What is the narrative which we need to build on Kashmir? And I personally feel that first we have to look at the Indian narrative. We have to deconstruct it, and then we have to reconstruct our narrative to actually match the Indian narrative. Um, the Indian elections and the forthcoming elections in Pakistan are important. I completely agree with Ambassador Basit that we need to be watchful. We need to wait and see. We don't. We shouldn't really get into a mode where we want to find quick fixes because I don't think they are any good fixes. Um, we need to watch the Indian moves. Uh, there is a possibility that there could be a, flag, a, a false flag operation because it really depends how pressurized uh, Mr. Modi feels in the elections and what is in place in India next year. Um, so uh, with a new government on in both countries, uh, I think the chances of uh, having some sort of a breakthrough would be there. But uh, obviously, like you know, the first step would be the full restoration of diplomatic relations. And then obviously, like you know, one has to be cautious. And uh, a structured dialogue, I don't think the Indians will want something like that. Um, I think uh, what we need to do is we use the back channel diplomacy, we need to use the think tanks, we need to use intellectuals to really make the edifice for any success of any structured dialogue. Um, but in Pakistan, I think we need to have clarity. We need to have all the stakeholders on board, whether it is the politicians, whether it is the academicians, or whether it is the uh, military people, because without a concerted approach, the chances of having any success in our Kashmir policy, I think, will remain minimal. With that, uh, I would like to thank all the esteemed participants for being here today and sharing their views. It was a very educated session, at least for me, and I'm sure you all share the feeling. Let's all give the speakers a big hand. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. And we will now have lunch. So uh, please uh, join us for lunch. Thank you again. And goodbye to Dr. Victoria Shkofi and Dr. Christopher Snyder. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.